So hopefully, guys, um, I obviously I want to make sure that that you're you're happy with this from a personal level that we can get a, a little bit of um, information on sleep hygiene. But hopefully, you can take something away for your your patients or your end users, your clients as well too, because the type of things that that I gonna, I'm going to talk about literally is 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 what I use in in, uh, in clinical practice myself as well. So I work I class myself as a clinical researcher rather than a career researcher. So I work with the um, the HSE in in uh, in Croom Orthopedic Hospital, and I research sleep and, and physical activity uh, with the University. Copenhagen as well too. So the plan today is we're going to have a chat about sleep and um, the importance of cortisol, our, our friend Mother Nature, and um, the a little bit of a, a discussion about the effects of sleep deprivation and um, what a sleep cycle is, mechanisms around reducing sleep, um, what a normal sleep is, if there is such a thing as normal, um, sleep and mental health, and uh, I bow down to those who are more experienced when it comes to, to mental health, but certainly the two of them, there's a, there's a huge correlation between the two. Um, I'm putting on my physio hat on, um, if you will uh, humor me as regards sleep and physical activity and exercise. Um, and then we'll talk about the rules um, uh, just for, for healthy sleep, the type of things that, that I would discuss with, uh, with my patients. So from an evidence point of view, um, if you look at the three um, sort of the, the triad, as we call it, from nutrition, physical activity and exercise and sleep, we know a lot of information about physical activity and exercise and, and nutrition. But we do have to wonder, um, is sleep the forgotten factor for those with a chronic condition? Now, I might talk about chronic condition here, but really sleep, sleep quality is, is the same for, for, for everybody um, as regards what we can do and what we, what we can't do. And when I started researching this about nine years ago, it was very much the the poor relation and and it seems to be on on the radio and and uh, and the tv quite quite a lot but in the overall scheme of affairs we actually know very very little about sleep would you believe so why do we sleep it's it's a normal body process and um, that allows our body and our brain to rest and it's it's very simple isn't it it's it's just a matter of getting comfortable closing our eyes and drifting off to sleep and if you saw my eyes this morning, you probably realize, well, if you know anything about sleep, how come your sleep wasn't good last night? But it is very, very deceptively simple. Um, um, but the problem is your sleep isn't good. You know exactly how, what it is about how you feel. Um, and I always think about when I talk to my patients, I always think like us human beings, we're, we're, we're beings, we're, we're physical, mental, emotional, spiritual beings. So um, any pain or discomfort that affects in one part can affect one and, and all of the other parts that uh, that, that make, a, make up as a, as, as a human. So without enough quality sleep, our bodies and our brains, they just can't work as, as they should because sleep actually is anti-inflammatory. Which is frightening, really, isn't it? Because, you know, inflammation is a natural thing. It's just we can have too much of it. So if we're not getting enough sleep, well, then that means we're putting our body in an inflammatory state. If we already have a condition that is already causing inflammation, then you can understand how this perfect storm comes through. But it, it is easier said than done. But there's a huge field of, of medicine devoted to um, entirely to sleep and, and treating conditions that affect and disrupt it. So why do we sleep? Um, funnily enough, up to recently, um, the experts thought that sleep and wakefulness were were, were, were kind of just, you know, not connected at all. Um, and we now know that that they're both as active as as they are. You know, you could even say that when you're when you're dreaming and when, when you're having your your nightmares and so on and so forth. So they are very very much active states. So these are all theories. Would you believe? So the first theory is to gain relief from our active state. We're not machines. We need to rest. We need to repair, um, and that healing and repair has a huge effect both on our body, but also our immune system. And we know with sleep deprivation, it can affect our metabolism. And obviously, sleep may help us save energy for when we need it most. And um, so I suppose generations and the DNA and the micro DNA has actually resulted in us that we, we actually have to sleep um, to, to, to repair, to heal, to learn. So it's how do we process um, things. Our brain obviously processes things at, at night time to, to filter things, to, to organize things as well too. And of course, the, one of the other theories is, is to dream and it's a byproduct of, of rapid eye movement, which we'll talk about uh, a, a little bit later on as well too. So um, if we look at chronic, chronicity, um, so my background is, is more in rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. So those with an immune or autoimmune condition. But if you think of it, as we get older, um, Obviously, our body is going to be in an inflammatory state just because of, 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 of our bodies just starting to, I suppose, not repair as much as what it should be. So sleep has an important role in maintaining health across the, the, the lifespan, which we'll discuss uh, in, 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 a, in a minute. 
and disrupted or low total sleep time. And total sleep time is the same as sleep duration. I, I'm only just going to stick to one one um one, one part here and you probably heard it, it's it's between seven and nine hours sleep uh, per night which you might think is a bit arbitrary but there's a little bit of science to, to, to go through with it but those that disturbed sleep and and reduced total sleep time can lead to really serious outcomes um like comorbidities and, and reduced physical activity and us humans we're meant to be active aren't we um regardless of of, of what age we are so sleep disturbance and poor sleep quality, we know they're prevalent complaints in people with chronic conditions like uh, rheumatic musculoskeletal diseases, uh, multiple cirrhosis, non-specific lower back pain, and, and so on. And poor sleeping quality and, and disturbances may exacerbate pain in these populations, which again reduce levels of physical activity. So I know we're all coming to, to, to the table with different, um, different backgrounds, uh, but there's always that opportunity you know, maybe sleep might be the missing link and it, it might be the missing link for us, but it might be the missing link for the patient. And I'm not going to into behavior change this uh, today because that's obviously another, another, another day's work or another year's work. Um, but I, I find just myself um, anecdotally that, that when I discuss sleep with patients, sometimes there's a bit of a light bulb moment and there's sometimes people think, well, should that's the way it is, you know? And I remember one person said to me uh, as part of the PhD, she says, well, look, I have to endure it, don't I? And I, it was on my mind for a while, but like, why do we have to endure something? Because it, there's a huge sense of helplessness to it, isn't there, you know? So um, what we do, what we are worried about is that if you get less than five hours sleep per day, it's been associated with cardiovascular issues, diabetes, obesity, uh, poor mental health. And that's because of sleep being an anti-inflammatory. So cardiovascular, diabetes, obesity, increased body fat, they're all inflammatory conditions, aren't they? So you know that, that perfect inflammatory sleep of, uh, of soup of uh, bradykinin and histamine and all that? You can have too much of good thing, can't you? So poor sleep quality can also be linked to poor mental health, including depression and anxiety. And people are, are rightly diagnosed with, with, with mental health issues, but medication isn't the be-all and end-all, is it? Um, from what, I, what I've been told by, by the experts, that if we don't prioritize sleep as part of, of, a, of a proper um, mental health engagement program, um, then we're on to a loser before we even start, really, to be honest with you. Um, and people with acute pain, chronic pain, they're, they're no exception. And, you know, me, you, our parents, our second and third cousin far removed can present with, with all these conditions, reducing our physical activities even further because physical activity is anti-inflammatory. The opposite, sedentary, is inflammatory. So this is where we get to this, this kind of, I suppose, mother nature trying to be at, at, at its best as such. Our good old friend cortisol. Oh, um, this, as, as you know, is, is the, 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 one of the best things we can have. It's just we can have too much of a good thing. So if you think of, of the, the high levels of stress, and that stress can be physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, that can increase our cortisol, it can increase our adrenaline, that can increase our sleep problems again, that can increase our sleep deprivation and fatigue, and we get this constant kind of cycle and circle of, of, of things. And, you know, while cortisol is important, well, how do we actually reduce it? Technically, we have to work within our what we call our circadian rhythm. So if you think of of, of it from a, a, a 12 hour day from 12 o'clock midday to 12 o'clock midday the following day, and you can see cortisol starts to drop just along here. And cortisol and adrenaline, they're stimulants, aren't they? They're, they're, they're natural stimulants for, for our body. But as you can see, it really starts to decrease there towards six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been on a night out, 10, half, 10, 11 o'clock, you know, you get this, I don't know, is it me, old age, but I get tired. I just, I just want to go home, do you know? And then all of a sudden I get this huge kind of, you know, bit of a jump in my step around maybe 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. And that's not the alcohol. It's, it's literally the cortisol starting to kick in again. So you can see then around 6 a.m. we start to wake up and then it's, and that's literally, that's the way it is. We, we can't really mess with that. We can think we can. And, and we can think we can add in stimulants like our good old caffeine. But as we know, caffeine is a stimulant that is highly addictive. And like all addictive things, um, it has to have an effect on our body. And in this case, it affects cortisol. So we need to understand about the importance of cortisol. And it's not about getting a routine from sleep, but it's also about how we can 
work within the circadian rhythm uh, for, for cortisol. So there are type of things that, that people um, talk to me in, 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 in clinic. They say like sleep is, is like the golden chain that binds our health and body together, but I, I don't know how, how, how that chain can bind it together. And I want to sleep, but my brain won't stop talking to itself. I think we've all been there, haven't we? And I've forgotten what it's like to have a normal sleeping pattern. Uh, sleep is always feels more important in the morning time. And sure, they're good old animals. We have a lot to learn from the animal world, don't we? You know, I can get by just in two hours sleep per per day as long as I sleep for 14 hours at night time. But I suppose these are the type of things that, that, that you know, when we're with our patients or our, our service users or our clients, we all, I suppose, favor our certain outcome measures with regards to the type of conditions that we're dealing with. And the effects of sleep deprivation are huge. So as you can see, irritability, cognitive repair, impairment. The interesting thing coming through from, from children and teenagers, there's some lovely research coming through that symptoms are similar to ADHD, which is kind of frightening, isn't it? You know, so, you know, it's a very, very important, obviously, from a, a spectrum point of view. But but if you're getting diagnosed with, with something that that isn't technically because of the condition that you have, but because of a sleep deprivation, because of a change of behavior, then we're kind of setting up somebody for for uh, for for losing before we even start. But look at things like the diabetes and so on. From a from a, a chronic condition, it certainly has a huge effect on our impaired immune system. And the other thing I've added in there is 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 mental health. And with regards to these two, it comes back to inflammation, doesn't it? And it comes back to how and what we can do to minimize as much inflammation as we possibly can. And there's about a dozen things that, at, at our disposal, which again, I'll, I'll talk about towards the end of, of, of the, the, the presentation. But if you could be just be mindful at the moment um, that all these effects of sleep deprivation comes back to inflammation and, and too much uh, cortisol. So um, the experts are telling us that we go through uh, five sleep cycles per night. And within each sleep cycle, you've got five stages. And this is pretty much sort of set in stone as such. There are some um, guidelines that they, they kind of amalgamate into like stage one and stage two is, is one, and then stage four and stage five is, is three. But it's a lot of the experts are content to agree. So starting at number one, it, it's that, you know, very light sleep. Um, there's occasional muscle, muscle twitching. You know, you kick, the, you kick the cat and, you know, then you're into stage two. And that's where your breathing pattern, your heart rate slows down. There's, there's a slight decrease in body temperature. And then you're getting into the more important parts of, of the sleep, like stage three and stage four. So stage three, quite small, isn't it? It's at four to six percent, but you need it before we get to stage four, because that's where that very deep sleep, um, li there's limited muscle activity, the brain produces delta waves and, and, and so on. And then the final part is, is the rapid eye movement, which is more, um, the more the softer issues, the more the mental health. So if we go through five of these cycles per night, and each cycle lasts roughly about 90 minutes, the mathematicians in the class are mu multiplying five by 90 minutes. You get 450 minutes, you get roughly about seven and a half hours. So that's where the sleep guidelines are coming from. You know, that seven to nine hours sleep per night that you probably heard. This is where it comes from, because regardless of whether we're male, female, young or old, we have to go through these stages. The frightening thing is that if we go through stage one, stage two, stage three, and we're woken up in stage four, which can be anything to do with pain, to go to the toilet, we go back to stage one again. So we may never finish stage four and we may never get to stage five. And if you go back to the cortisol and the circadian rhythm, remember things start to really kind of uh, level out at about half 10, 11 o'clock, maybe half 11 o'clock at night. That's when the body's really trying to shut down. And, and it has to shut down because it, it, the body is doing so much for kidneys and liver and processing brain um, fluid and, and so on and so forth. So in the earlier part of the night, the brain is heal healing more physically. And in the second part of the night, from roughly about half to three o'clock onwards, it's healing or processing more mentally. And certainly those with pain or, or any mental health, health issues, they will say that they probably will be waking from two to three o'clock at night because 
physically the body is forcing the body to shut down in the early part of the night because it, if you don't heal in some shape or form you're not going to be able to put one foot in front of the, the other so in the early parts of the night from half 10 11 half 11 o'clock at night stage one stage two stage three four are prior, prioritized you do get a little bit of stage five and then in the second part maybe two, three o'clock in the morning onwards, it's more predominantly stage five, but you still get one, two, three, and four because you have to go through these stages. So if you look at it again from a cycle point of view, um, the first stage is the interim consciousness of sleep. It's that, you know, you get the muscle twitch, then the heart rate slows down, the brain does less complicated tasks, you, you, the body makes repair, the, then you're into stage three, four, and then finally you're into stage five. And this is a very cyclical thing. It's very iterative. Um, we can't mess with mother nature, even though we might think we can with melatonin and sleep medication and so on and so forth. And there'll be obviously questions as regards sleep medication later on. Um, but this is where, where we are. So five sl sleep cycles per night, five stages within each, each sleep cycle. If we don't go through those stages um, correctly, we might get away with one or two of the sleep cycles, but literally we won't be able to get away with all five of the sleep cycles. So we're all different, aren't we? Thankfully, we're all different. And there's some very interesting um, research about, you know, some of us think we're night owls and some of us think we're, we're larks. So you can see 20% to 10%. There's still a good 70% chunk of a difference out of it aren't you know so your majority of us are homing birds we we go through phases in life from teenage to adulthood to having children to you know more of a challenge in career and job and and so on and so forth so we tend to change but there still is more of a dna that we tend to be but the majority of us are and you probably think going back to your your school and college days of, of where you know you were up all night and you want to sleep all day you might think you are one or the other. So have a think. Which bird are you? So um, I thought it might be interesting. I'm just taking a sip of water here at the moment. In case you think the HSC internet is going, which I won't jinx. So I thought you might be interested in, in the type of, of breakdown between um, the type of mechanisms involved in reducing sleep quality and chronic conditions. I've put in chronic conditions because these are what, these are what the auditors, uh, authors have, have come up with. But realistically, a lot of these we can get away with in the short term, but it's that medium to long term. And the jury is out how long a medium to long term is. They reckon six to eight weeks of a sleep deprivation, sleep disturbances will start to break the body down either physically, mentally or emotionally. So if you look at this, the, the disease-related variables, pain, how do we reduce pain? And it might be the simple thing that people need to take their pain medication according to what they've been advised. And you know, some people say, oh, I don't like to take medication, and then yet the pain wakes them up at night time. So we might have to stress to them to discuss it with their medical practitioner, to their GP, to their consultant, that they need to take their pain medication when they actually do rather than just taking it when they need it. The morning stiffness is, is something you particularly find from a rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease. Um, that can really kind of kick in, you know, that cortisol when it starts to wake you up at half five, six o'clock in the morning. And stiffness isn't pain. It's a very distinct thing where you're trying to move your joints of your feet and, and your, your, um, your, your fingers. And this might be something simply take your time. We do get a, a lot of cervical involvement, particularly with degenerative diseases, and that's a huge effect on sleep apnea. So it might be that I refer somebody for a sleep study, um, and sleep ap apnea is very much undiagnosed, and you need a, a, a consultant sleep a medical practitioner to, to diagnose that. There's, um, there's um, rheumatoid arthritis and sleep medication, and we know with sleep medication, it, it only lasts four to six weeks. And after four to six weeks, the benefit of taking it is gone. So you're taking it either for a placebo or you might be taking it because the body is used to it, which is the last thing you want to do. The other thing is fatigue. Fatigue is that all encompassing physical, mental, and emotional fatigue rather than just tiredness. And we know from research, the best thing for physical activity, physical activity, oh, sorry from fatigue is physically activity even, um, 
And what's active for me is different to you, is different to somebody who's going through a flare up of rheumatoid arthritis or MS or, or Parkinson's. And it might be a situation that they are sitting on the chair doing some marching on the spot to get their heart rate up a little bit more. And, and I, I, you know, I don't mean to be facetious with, with regards to saying that's all it is. It's not. I know it's not. But these are the type of things that I would, that I would kind of discuss with, with somebody. Um, and I know we're, we're probably having a, another one of these maybe in March if, if, if you're interested. So we can sort of come back and maybe if you've, in, if you've introduced some of these to, to, to your practice. And mood disturbances, the insomnia, the hypersomnia. And the last thing we're finding out is, is that inflammation. I keep coming back to this all the time. Um, I'm not making you, I'm not trying to make you out into, um, into physiologists, but you know, you've got your TNF alphas, your interlichens, all these interlichens that there's a new one coming up every month that they're finding. Um, if there's too much of these, then it's going to have an effect on, on, on your sleep as well too. So the, um, National Sleep Foundation in, in the U S they, they, they've broken, uh, the, the normal sleep and the normal aging into, into. I suppose you could say a, um, a categorization and infancy awake rapid eye movement non rapid eye movement is like a third a third a third maturity we tend to get more awakeness non rem rem and you can see in old age we get a bit more broken sleep and that's because of inflammation and that's just the way it is and sometimes when i say that to, to people you know particularly the older population like our parents or grandparents it's not I always sort of say to people, things can change, but just because you're getting a little bit older does not mean to say age is a barrier because there might be small things that will maybe stop or lessen these awake times at night that we can actually talk about as well too. Um, but I never sort of say to people, oh, you know, there's, there's such a thing as a perfect sleep because we're all different. The other thing is that they come across the sleep um, recommendations across the lifespan. Uh, you can see that the newborns kind of make sense here. And we've probably all heard about the teenagers, you know, the reason why they are need more sleep than us. They, the reason why they need more sleep is because they're growing. Uh, the reason why they can't get up in the morning is because cortisol and, and everything else. So the majority of us need seven to nine hours sleep per night. The reason why they get a breakdown like that is because none of us get a seven and a half perfect hour sleep per night. And if we do, it's very, it's very few. We wake up full of the joys of life, but we're back to where we are again. So if you can get the seven to nine hour, nine hour sleep per night, happy days. But there is this this thing called sleep debt, as in D-E-B-T. And you cannot get that back at the weekends, all right? Even if we think we might want to. The other thing is to really acknowledge sleep and mental health. Um, obviously, as a society, thankfully, we're getting a little bit more comfortable in talking about it. But of course, I, again, I bow down to the experts in the audience. We've got a long way to go, don't we? And you probably realize that that trying to broach sleep is, is a very hard thing to do with, with people because, you know, that lack of sleep breaks down into tiredness, breaks down into difficulty coping with daily life, then feels into the slow, the low self-esteem, feelings of worry and so on and so forth. And, you know, th th they are obviously connected as, as mental health disorders and um, both are associated with, with, with sleep disturbances and treatment should focus on both mental health and, and sleep quality at, the, at this stage. And this is, this is research going back to, to 2013. So this is um, an outcome measure that, that, that I tend to use. Um, it's called the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. Do I do this with all my patients? No, um, it's like your clinical reasoning. It's like, what do you prioritize? Um, and if I feel that somebody, that I feel that, that, that if we need to prioritize sleep, to get somebody to be more physically active, to help with their sleep, to help with maybe less flare-ups that they're getting. And this is a valid and reliable outcome measure in practically every population, rheumatic, musculoskeletal, sports, teenagers, um, neurological conditions. It, it's been tried and tested in a lot of them and it is very valid and reliable. Plus as well, it's, it's a nice kind of a user tool that I get somebody to fill out and it gets them thinking about their things. Um, and it's, it's just something I thought may, maybe you, you could use yourself and it's, it's got a very easy scoring thing at the very end as well too. And I, I use it as a bit of homework for people as well too, that if I'm bringing them back, um, it, it kind of gets them to, to, to think. 
But the other problem then, of course, is us humans, we want it and we want it now, don't we? <laughs> and so we don't necessarily want to maybe necessarily have the time and effort to and the motivation and the discipline to, to, to just work on one thing and one thing only. Putting my physio hat on, uh, there is huge amounts of research to do to go with physical activity and exercise. And again, what's different for me is different for you. But it's not about getting just people to go for a walk because they might be able to go for their walk because of fatigue, because of pain. So the type of things that, that I might be, be doing with people is how do I increase their heart rate? And increasing their heart rate is the key to using physical activity and exercise to find the nervous system to work that little bit higher. Because if we do, then we're putting the body in a little bit of an inflammatory state. So it might be that, you know, if I've cleared somebody for physical activity, they're sitting down, they're doing marching on the spot a little bit and the hands in the air. And that's literally going to increase their heart rate a little bit more as long as it's safe and, 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 and reliable. And that might be enough. And, and that's, that's where the research is going. Um, and reduce lower levels of, of exercise. Um, it increases the likely uh, likelihood of reporting sleep. And in addition, we're still, I suppose, battling as a society, uh, those who are diagnosed with a chronic condition, oh, don't be active. Um, and it's still something because, you know, no matter how good family and friends are, um, they can be too kind, can't they? They can be too kind. They can kill them with kindness. And it is about making sure we get people moving in some shape or form because of all the things that, that, that we just uh, discussed. So just a little bit about um, physical activity and, and, and exercise. And again, I'm not trying to create um, uh, physiologists of you, but if you just happen to look at exercise and, and sleep, and these are the, I suppose, I might throw a few little nuggets of information to people if I think that they're buying into this thing called sleep. So if you break it down between acute, uh, acute but subsequent chronic effect and chronic effect. So acute is, I exercise today, how is my sleep going to be tonight? A chronic Acute but chronic would be between six to eight weeks. Like everything we do, it does take about six to eight weeks for 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 a home exercise program to kick in. And the other thing is chronic effects, which is greater than than, than eight weeks. So the positive effects are central nervous fatigue. So in other words, I exercise today, I'm tired, I'll go to sleep that little bit more. There might be a better chance of um because of the the increase in, in body temperature during the night. Um, there might be a little bit extra that if you are sweating during the day, you'll sweat less at night, which might mean that your body temperature is, is that little bit lower. Uh, and then that feeds into your heart rate and your heart variability change as well, too. The six to eight weeks, like all exercise programs, you're, you're metabolizing sugar a little bit more. You're going to release um, growth hormone a little bit more. And the interesting thing, the BDNF is the brain-derived neuropratic factor. And that's literally the way we process our memories. We process things that are happening the way we process our mental health. So again, sometimes people think, oh, physical activity and exercise, people keep ramming it down my health because of uh, my mental health. And there's no discussion in the matter. But sometimes I might just try, okay, park that and say, look, how would you find your sleep? And they might say, oh, I'd love to work on my sleep. So that might be another way or a cute way or that, that I might go in to try and help them with physically to get more physically active, that we're not focusing on the physical activity, we're more focusing on the sleep rather than anything else. And then, of course, then we got the chronic effect, which is more the heart rate variability change. So in other words, at um, sedentary is your heart rate at 70. It's not up, up to 100 and your body competition changes and so on and so forth. So, again, the research is saying that there is beneficial effects, but they're very small and they vary in robustness. If I exercise today, my sleep might be better tonight. So it really comes back to that regular exercise. Like everything we do, it does take that six to eight weeks of a regular intensity to come through. How much? I'll tell you later on. So um, just putting my, my research hat on just, just for a second, and but again, just to show you where, where, where the research has come from and, and why we really need to... I suppose be comfortable in discussing this 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 with our our, our patients service users but i did it we did a bit of research back in 2017 looking at a subjective sleep profile of, of those with a rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases and it was a pretty large 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 study and we found that those who participated they using the pittsburgh sleep quality index uh outcome measure that i showed you earlier on their mean total sleep time is 5.7 hours per night 
and if you go back to the start of the presentation where, where I was telling you that anything less than five hours sleep per night is putting your body in an inflammatory state. You're getting very close to this, aren't you? And they already have an increased inflammatory auto biomarkers compared to the average um, population. A majority of those reported their sleep quality is bad. And roughly about a third who were taking sleep medications also reported their sleep quality is bad, which is kind of frightening, isn't it? They were taking sleep medication, but it wasn't helping with their sleep because they were probably taking it for more than six, four to six weeks. And that doesn't matter whether it's over-the-counter medication or prescribed medication. So those who had, a, had the condition longer were taking sleep medication at least once a week and limited in their physical activities rated their sleep quality as bad. So there was the perfect storm. Our statistician looked at it, though, from a very interesting point of view. And this is the big thing we took about, out about it was that those who were more active had nearly four hours of activity. They had the longest sleeping time. And those with the lowest physical activity had less than an hour's sleeping time. And we were pretty surprised at that. So, of course, we, we, when we got it and you're surprised, you'd love to know, go back and say, oh, God, I'd love to have asked the X, Y, and Z. But, but that was the study and that's just the way it is. So it, it's not that... It, it, it doesn't necessarily help them with their signs and symptoms per se, we don't know, but those who are physically active certainly have longer total sleep time, which then puts their body in an inflammatory state longer, which may help them with their signs and symptoms. So we looked at it from objective, we had to look at it from an objective to see where, where, where we were with it. Interestingly, those who were using the physical activity guidelines. So if you think of the American College of Sports Medicine, the World Health Organization, they tell us to be active for roughly about 30 minutes per day of moderate activity. And we used a thing called a sensor. Um, so it, it's, it's like an accelerometer, uh, basically. And look at that. We, we, we had to cut out to make sure we were looking at the, the right the, the, um, I imputation of, of the figures. So we looked at only those who wore it for 95% of the time and a minimum of five days. They had a total sleep time of 5.7 hours, which is the exact same as, as the, the, um, the subjective with roughly a median of, of 1.25 hours sleep per night. So those who were more physically active had longer total sleep time. So whether we look at it from subjective or objective for this population, can we extrapolate it? We don't know, but the law of averages, more than likely we can. So it's certainly not going to do us any harm. So the key points just to take from, from this section, um, folks, is that sleep is essential for maintaining health. Total sleep time is, is, is low for people with a chronic condition, 5.7 hours sleep per night. We need to be mindful of reducing cortisol. A chronic condition can in, contribute to altered sleep quality and reduce total sleep time even further again. Uh, those with a rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease, which are a pretty huge population, everything from rheumatoid arthritis to osteoarthritis to gout to, to, to it, 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 all those we other weird and wonderful conditions that, that, that we come across. Um, those, uh, they report sleep quality. The use of act exercise is advocated for, for poor sleep quality and um, including those with a chronic condition. So that's really the, 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 the key points to, to get to take from, from this section. So what type of exercise? There's, there's so much, isn't there? So the research is telling us that we can break up exercise into aerobic and anaerobic. So if you think of aerobic with oxygen and anaerobic with less oxygen, so aerobic being you're walking, you're running, you're, you know, you can go for longer periods of time. Anaerobic, your strength training, your resistance training, your high intensity training where you can go for, you know, you can go for time, but not necessarily that long. It's aerobic where the research is. If you were going to prescribe exercise, that's where we're, we're looking at. So what type of exercise? There was something in Hippoc Hippocrates, wasn't there? You know, walking is man's best medicine. It's Low cost, it's easy to do, it can be done with friends, but exercise per se as regards walking doesn't necessarily have to be the 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity five times a week. We know now that we can get a benefit out of 10 minutes slots. And that's a little bit more manageable for people with a, a chronic condition and with all the associated signs and symptoms of fatigue and pain and, and so on. So 
walking, we know there's, there's a lot more benefits and it's great for cardiovascular and respiratory and so on and so forth. But if we look at it from a, a fit principle, um, and fit is really short for frequency, intensity, time, and type. And this is something that, that I used for a, a, a pilot RCT, or RCT even for my um, uh, PhD. And we looked at it from the, the basic recommendations uh, that the, the experts are saying that, you know, we need to be three to five times a week. We need to have a moderate vigorous intensity of 11 to 15. We need to be doing it for 20 to 30 minutes, but actually we can do it in blocks of 10 minutes at a time. And the other thing is, is aerobic. This is the interesting thing about the intensity. How intense do we actually really need to know? Well, I use what we call the board scale of perceived exertion, which some of you might, might, might know. There's another one from zero to 10. The one I use six to 20 is because it's more valid and reliable. So we need to be in this green area of moderate to somewhat hard. And if you look at the numbers here, six to 20, if you put a zero there, it's more than likely that if somebody's saying, yeah, I'm, fair, I'm pretty fairly easy, I'm at 11, they're probably, their heart rate is probably at 110. So if they go up to, oh God, you're feeling that really, really hard, their heart rate is probably at 170. So this is where we need to be at, where it's somewhat hard, it's moderate hard. And I give this to, to, to patients to, to use because, you know, accelerometers, um, iPhones, all those type of things that we think are wonderful, they're actually not great because the, the, the research is, is showing that we can get a bit obsessed with it. So it comes back to the very, very basics, the most simplest things that, that, that we can actually use. So the, the tips that I would actually use for, from, from a, I suppose, the guidelines and the rules for, for, for healthy sleep. Uh, so th these are the type of things that, that, I, that I say to people and I have it sort of laminated and I give it to, to my patients as well too. You get up at the same time, regardless of whether you, that is Monday to Friday or Saturday to Sunday. Because if you don't, the body will never get used to it. And unfortunately, if, you, if your time, excuse me, if your time is all over the place, what happens then is, is you mess with the cortisol, you mess with the circadian rhythm. And that's why this is so important. And so it's like everything, we'll only change and behavior change if maybe we understand why we're doing something. And if we understand why we're doing something, we're kind of halfway there, aren't we? So it, I say to people, well, why you need to do it is because of cortisol. And more or less everybody's heard about a cortisol and, and adrenaline and everything else. It's a stimulant. It's just you can have too much of a good thing. The routine, the bedtime routine, it, it's that situation where uh, you're not doing your work in the bed. You're not, you know, you, you're winding down, for, so to speak. And that winding down really needs to be for the half, 10, 11 o'clock. Why? Good old friend cortisol. If you're going to bed at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, you're fighting with the circadian rhythm. You're fighting with the best of mother nature. Sometimes people talk about a relaxing bath. And if you look at our nervous system, and if you look at our autonomic nervous system, and if you remember that autonomic nervous system of sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, which is like fight and fight, rest and digest, that is like a YouTube. It, it happens dozens of times a day. It's just because of the challenges of life, the stressors of life, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, our body can be very much in that fight and flight for too long, which then increases cortisol, increases inflammatory, and biomarkers. So maybe a bath can relax it. Maybe yoga can relax it. Maybe clinical Pilates, maybe meditation, maybe a book can help it. The cool and dark room kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, the dark room, because obviously our the, the, the nerves in our eyes that are connected to the brain, we're trying to calm the nervous system down. We're trying to calm the the, the, um, the, the fight and flight and allow the rest and digest to come up. So like that YouTube that we used to remember in, in, in our school days, sometimes reading books and you can see it's books, not the iPad, not the iPhone, huge amounts of research coming out now about blue light. And some people say, oh, I've got a screen that protects the blue light. It doesn't. It's just a waste of money. So ideally you throw out the TV in the bedroom, which <laughs> It's like a first world problem, isn't it? But if you wake up at nighttime and you put the TV on, there's no way you're going to go back to the proper sleep where 
your five stages of sleep are going to come through. Your sleep cycles are going to come through. It's as simple as. Sometimes relaxing music can help. So there are the do's, the don'ts, gadgets, phones, iPads, um, things that watches out the door, out the window, don't even bring them into the bedroom. And the reliability can be between 20%, it's between 10% and, and, and 30%. So, you know, you might think you're doing well, or even sometimes you might think you're doing bad because the variability of them can go both ways. Um, caffeine, yeah, it's, it's massive, isn't it? Do you know? And it's not coffee, it's the stimulant. It's all the other stimulants like tea, like everything else that, that needs six to eight hours to leave our body. Um, hard training, that's where the anaerobic comes through. That's where it doesn't really help anaerobic. The stress, oh God, how many times have we actually said to our own ourselves, how do we reduce stress? And we can verbalize it, we can talk about it, but if we don't do something, it'll affect our sleep if our body isn't going to get that healing physically, mentally. We're going to increase the inflammatory biomarkers. And then, unfortunately, we do know that those who are diagnosed with an autoimmune condition have a history of poor sleep, whether that is night work or whether it is just habits that are not just having through heavy food kind of makes sense because um yeah it it, it just needs di needs to digest doesn't it you know we don't need food in, in in our stomach from half 10 at night because the body's trying to heal the challenges during the day not trying to process the food out, out of our gut and our intestines and the tv not in the bedroom it's it's it you know if, if you can remember back i don't know if you remember back to your your grandparents and parents days remember the old tv where sometimes you might see flickering or you might see it on, on tv where it flickers that's still flickering it's just because of the high definition we don't see it but our eyes do the nerves in our eyes do the nerves that eyes connect to the brain does the brain does as well too so that's the reason why and some people just do kicking and screaming but we know after six to eight weeks it's one good thing that actually helps I explained, I just said to you earlier on about um, a, 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 one of my participants that they had, we were going through everything and all that type of stuff. And even after her engaging with the sleep, she says, oh, I just have to endure it. Nobody should feel that sleeplessness is something they simply have to endure. If they come to the table, like all behavior change, it takes time. But a lot of the time, particularly from a physio point of view, people come to us and they say, oh, I know you're going to talk about me, get me being physically active. A lot of the time I say, no, no, I'm not. No, no, no. But but if if I want to try and get sleep in the back door and if they say, yeah, I really want to improve sleep, that's where I might actually be a bit cute and try and get 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 a bit, bit sleep. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's just, it, it breaks my heart to think that people say, ah, that's just the way it is. It's not. We're humans. We're meant to move. We're meant to sleep. We're meant to be physically active. But we can change. Is it easy? Of course not. There's a few references for your, a little bit of bedtime reading, pardon the pun. And I presume you've got a, a few questions if, if you have. So I'll just stop sharing that and we'll get back to where we Thank are. you, Sean. That was really fantastic. A deep dive into sleep for ourselves, yeah, I, for yeah. our own selves and for our families, our communities and, and our service users. And I think, you know, um, a lot of people have already been asking could they have a recording of this because there's a lot to actually to take in so it is I, yeah it is yeah exactly yeah because yeah. there's sorry to interrupt you Michelle there's, there's some wonderful books and there's some wonderful presentations but I suppose it's always like the buzzwords isn't it, it it's it's the type of things that I can actually do you know that that, that, that can sort of tease out of yeah can I ask a question oh yeah absolutely if anybody has any questions so I was interested in getting up at the same time actually just as a useful tip for 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 myself so that just uh, and you talked about sleep debt so that if you're mm. missing sleep, is it are you better just from a practical point of view, are you better getting up at the same time uh, and going to bed earlier the next night? Uh, say if you've been late up one night rather than trying to sleep it off in the morning or is, is there any kind of direction on that? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, we all like to think that, that, that you know, we can pay we this payback at the weekend, you know. Um, but um, no, our kids will tell you another thing, won't they? But um, I suppose if you think of, of that, that circadian rhythm, we, we can't really mess with that. So just because it's the weekend or four day week, um, you, re you still need to, to, to get up. And that comes back to the sleep cycle as well, too, because if you mess with the sleep stages, 
you might be getting a little bit more of a stage five at the expense of stage one, stage two, and stage three. And, and it's interesting about, you know, the, the 40 winks and, and the, the siesta and everything else. 40 winks is br are brilliant. So rather than necessarily sleeping in it during the day, if you could get your 40 winks in the afternoon, like Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, happy days. The reason is because you are only getting into sleep one or stage one, two, and three. If it's less, if it's more than the 40, 45 minutes, you wake up and you're groggy, aren't you? You know, and that's where you're getting into stage five. So do your 40 winks. Absolutely. 40 minutes, happy days. Okay, great. I'll be doing that at the weekend. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Sean. There's another question there in the chat box. I don't know if you can see it. Um, somebody just asking, um, but they, they're saying they tend to sleep with their phone charging on their bedside locker. Is there much harm in doing so? Should it be charging outside the room for the night? Yeah. Yeah, it should be charging outside the room at night because it actually gives up uh, automatic. You don't even realize it, but it's actually giving up automatic updates all the time. Um, and those updates because of Wi-Fi, because of everything else, you know, and, and it's another good thing that people have their Wi-Fi box inside the bedrooms as well, too. It's a disaster because actually that affects with the brain waves, because even though we think we're asleep, it's an active state, isn't it? So that active state is actually picking up all the time. So anything electronic needs to be out of out of out of it. You know, actually, one person there is saying about plane mode. I don't know about that actually. That's interesting um, because obviously, if you have it on plane mode, then it is you're trying to. to I'll have to come back to you with that. I don't know. I haven't haven't heard about that before now. Or electromagnetic. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, they don't work. I know you can spend a fortune. Um, or a case, no, don't work. Um, they've, 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 there's some fantastic research coming out of the uh, University of Sydney at the moment, uh, and they've, they've, they've done it, and it's, it's, yeah, it sounds great in practice, doesn't it? You know, but it, it's just the high definition um, doesn't, uh, do, it doesn't stop the waves, it do, and it doesn't stop the, uh, the nerves of the eyes to calm it down, and then they're connected to, to, to the brain as well too. Perfect. Somebody said men menopause. Yeah. Um, it's 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 rough, isn't it? You know, that's why men are from Mars and women from Venus. <laughs> it's 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 cruel. It, it it very very much is cruel. It it is about working with it, unfortunately. Um, HRT does help, um, because it is, I suppose, regulating the the hormones to to some shape or form. Um, I suppose with menopause, you, you're getting into that different stage of of life cycle. And, and you're getting into that different stage of where you're going to have a bit more um, erratic uh, breakup of sleep. And it's not about minimizing the breakup of sleep. It's about minimizing the time of the breakup of sleep. So if you wake up at nighttime because of menopause or because of other different things, you get up. It's, 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 it's as, you know, because if you're tossing and you're turning, you're expending energy anyway, aren't you? So if you get up and, you know, you walk around not exercising and um, within 20 to 30 minutes, they say the body's gone back to stage one again. And then you'll start that feeling a little bit drowsy again. But if you start looking at the phone, the iPad, all those things, it's, it's not going to work for you. So I suppose it is about managing, reducing cortisol, reducing your sleep disturbances rather than using other things to stop menopause because it's going to happen anyway, isn't it? Perfect, that's Sean. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or pop them in the, in the chat box. Um, I just have a quick question, Sean, if I can, while we're waiting for some more to come in then. And it's kind of aligned, as was to Michelle's question, but I'm one of those, the, the larks, the early risers, and um, it's really easy in the summer. Um, it's lovely and bright, and, but now in the you know, as it's getting darker and darker, it's harder. And I often wonder, just in terms of, um, you know, with circadian rhythms and natural light, should we be more aligned to, should I be sleeping in longer than in the winter and, and more aligned to, to light? Because that's naturally, I suppose, how we were genetically designed, let's say. So have you any thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it, yeah, good question. It's e evolution, isn't it? You know, um, and certainly now that we're coming into that season of, of, of seasonal affective disorder, um, we tend to do more hibernating, if that kind of makes sense too, you know. Um, and because of the light and the changes in light and because of the change, timing change um, towards the end of, of, of October, it, it takes about three weeks just to reconcile that hour. Um, and it's not, I suppose, it's about allowing ourselves, actually to, to, to have that extra bit of, I suppose, not necessarily sleep, but time in bed. 
or maybe allowing ourselves in the morning I'm a bit more groggier because the daylight isn't there, do you know? But it's not that we need to change with the seasons because our circadian rhythm doesn't change with the seasons. That's just the way it is and, and it, 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 it needs to do it, you know? So I suppose it's, it's about managing to the point where you're getting as less sleep disturbances as, as possible. Thanks. I think there was a couple of more questions yeah. there. Was it Connor, Connor Mahoney there? Is that my, my old mate Connor Mahoney, as the saying goes? Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's have you any specific phrases? Oh, yeah, for use to help with, with their sleep. Um, I suppose I try to be cute. I, I, try to, to, I try to find people how they buy into it. And it is very topical sleep at the moment, isn't it? It, it, it is about trying to find ways that, that somebody can find that they're, that they're going to sleep. Um, I tend to use, um, why would you want to improve your sleep? So it's like putting the onus back on the, on, on the person r r rather than me telling them what, what to do. Um, I, I think about phrases, you, you've caught me in the hot there, Connor. Um, I, I, I tend to talk more about what to do at the start rather than don't. And then think more the quality rather than the quantity actually that's probably one of the more things that i would tend to do quality rather than quantity so i might focus on one thing that they might feel that is doable or manageable and then that might have a sort of a cascade effect to, to, to other things as well too you know um come back to me in march connor and, and I'll, I'll i'll tell you thanks sean there's another one there that came in before that then just in relation to eye masks um would wearing one every night be of benefit and avoid some disturbances it is actually, and, and, and I'll add in ear, ear um, plugs as well too, um, because the, the eye mask is, is, is lovely, but the eye mask is, is they have to be made of, of satin, would you believe? Because um, cloth or linen or anything like that can, can aggravate the, the, uh, the what you call it, the, um, the tear ducts. Um, so eye masks, absolutely, they're, 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 they're brilliant because I suppose it just blocks the, the light out a little bit, you know? Um, and the earplugs. Now, earplugs are, are an acquired taste because if, if you put them in, you can hear your heart rate or actually more importantly, you can hear the cortisol, you can hear the adrenaline, you can hear that pumping kind of a thing. So it's very much an acquired taste. I know some people try them, some people swear by them and um, it's not going to do us any harm. Um, but if they find that they can just hear their, they think it's their heart rate, but actually it's the cortisol coming through. But if it's something that's, that's just trying to, you know, the light sleeper, if they're trying to kind of, you know, Trying to help the, the, the sleep um, sleep stages of the sleep cycle. Thanks, Sean. There's another question there about melatonin, um, and probably we've only time maybe for one or, or two last questions. Then, um, mm. any negative issue associated with the use of it? No, um, it, it's great for the four to six weeks, but it's great. It, sorry, it's not great on a, as a standalone. Um, and of course, you know, the majority of us human beings, when we take something, we think it's a standalone thing, isn't it? You know, it's just one of those things that help us um, to, to, to change or to behavior change. It, it not necessarily is going to do any harm, but there is a, a placebo effect after the four to six weeks. Oh, God, if I don't take it, well, I'm, my sleep's going to be very poor anyway. And that Perfect. goes regardless of whether it's over the counter um, sleep, um, um, active ingredient sleep med melatonin or if it's um, prescribed. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, I think that's all the questions there. And um, we have recorded, and there's been a few questions about that. So we will be sending out the recording. Sean, there was a couple of um, queries, though, in terms of your slides. Are you happy for those to be shared? Or... Oh, yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah. So we'll send. Perfect. We'll, we'll send the slides and the recording then out to everybody who'd registered. So thanks so much, Sean. Um, just so much information there. Lots of process. I think we'll all be looking at the recording again to kind of pick up <laughs> things we, we might have caught the first time around. So uh, loads, loads yeah. of, of valuable and information maybe, there. And maybe just to mention that Sean has agreed to run another webinar in March on the 15th of March. So I think, you know, it would be great to come back and hear more. Absolutely. And it's, Absolutely. As, 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 as Michelle said earlier on as well, it's... Um, Great timing because it'll be it'll be just near sleep day, so <laughs> might give us a bit of bit a bit of a kick. Perfect. Yeah. So th thanks so much um, from the Wellness at Work team to Sean and to everybody for attending, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events as well. So enjoy your lunch. Right. Take Lovely. care. Thanks, Thank guys. you, everyone. All bye bye. Bye.